any questions that you might have about uh, chapter four homework, which is due tonight, um, or chapter five homework, since we finished those. And I am going to be, um, I've got office hours after class as well, and I can stay a little bit longer if needed. But right now, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, Tammy, go ahead. I had a question on um, 46 on finding the smallest contribution and the tax savings. I am struggling with that one. And it's on, on chapter five. Chapter five. What was the number again? Oh, excuse me. 46. Did you say 36? 46. 46, sorry. Huh? All right. Hmm. Okay, so here we are looking at that contribution rate. So we did, um, remember, we've got to uh, figure out what our reserve ratio is. Does anybody remember off the top of their head what that um, equation looks like, that reserve ratio? What? So we got to find the average payroll. Okay. So do you remember the um, the equation? We can take it. We can open it up. So remind everybody. On, just a second. Let me get the. So, and somebody just raised their hand. Who is that? Okay, so we've got to find that reserve ratio. We're um, going to take uh, the contributions that have been made minus the benefits that have been paid out divided by that average uh, average payroll. So contributions. Minus benefits paid divided by that average ratio. This gets us our reserve ratio. So let's look at the problem here again. Okay, so we've got Hiram Company located in state A, average annual payroll of 850,000 for the three 12 month periods ending on June 30th. Um, as of June 30th, 2022, the total contributions that have been made um, in, ex in excess of the benefits charged amounted to 17,440. So they've already done that calculation there. Um, so their reserve ratio should be, what's it, 17,440 divided by 850,000. Let me make sure we've got no other information up here at the top. No. All right, so. Let's 
17 or 40. So 2%. Let's see, round to two decimal places already. So two. Go five, I think. <clears throat> so we rounded that to two decimal places, so this comes out to two, so point zero two five. All right. Um, Okay, so the contribution right now, we apply that to the table. So 2% or more, but less than 2.2%, 4.9% is what I get. There. So we're just taking this number here and applying it to that table. Okay. The smallest contribution that the company can make in order to reduce its tax rate if state A permits voluntary contributions. Okay, so if we're reducing our tax rate from 4.9% to let's say 4.6%, that means we've got to get our, our reserve ratio up to 2.2% at least 2.2%. All right, so we want it, if this becomes X, we need to figure out what X is minus uh, what the benefits have, let's see. So actually this is gonna be X here. Um, so X divided by 850 equals 2.2. So we've got to solve for X here. So put on your thinking caps here. Remember, we're going to multiply both sides then by 850,000. So eighteen thousand seven hundred X equals. 18,700. So instead of 17,440, we need this to be 18,700. So we find the difference between those two, and that's the additional contribution that would need to be made. So 17,440, 660, to $1,260. Okay, so the additional amount, like, like I said, you got now you because you've got a different unknown now, but we do know what we want that tax rate to be or that reserve ratio to be. Okay, um, tax savings realized by the company taking into consideration the voluntary contribution made if the taxable payroll in 2023 is $980,000. So now what we're just going to do is figure out the difference between those two tax rates. So 4.6%, I'm sorry, 4.9% versus 4.6%, 0 0.3%, right? You can just take that. Um, oh, this is a bad marker. This is where I get a workout in, I'm trying to get this stuff off. Um, okay, so the difference between our tax rates is. 0.3%, right, I'm sorry, yeah, 
0.3% and our wages are $980,000. So we'll just take 980,000. This pen marker is gonna do the same thing. You can already tell. $2,940 in taxes. It's going to reduce their taxes. But I think the question is, how much did they realize um, taking into consideration the fact that they're going to have to pay an additional amount, right? They've got, they've got to pay to buy down that rate. And so the amount that they uh, paid was how much was it again? I erased it, so I can't remember. Oh, it's right up there, 1260. So this is the additional paid. So we're just going to get the difference between those two. 2940 minus, so 1680. This is their net savings. So they had to pay an additional $1,260 to get that lower rate, but the lower rate resulted in a tax savings of $2,940. So overall, they saved $1,680 on uh, between the two. Does that, does that make sense, Tammy? Can you see? Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so you just, you kind of have to back into it a little bit. Other questions? So that one is, that one's asking you to kind of go above and beyond and think a little bit further. Other questions? Mm -hmm. 28. 28? 2, 30. 38. Okay. On, the, on chapter five? Yes. Okay, so Ron Valdez worked for two different employers. Let me make this a little bit bigger. No. Two different employers until May, he worked for Rolling Construction in Ames. Hey, um, he earned $22,000. State unemployment rate for Roland is 4.6%, then changed jobs, worked for Ford Improvement Company in Topeka, Kansas, earned $29,500 for the rest of the year. The state unemployment rate for Ford is 5.1%. So determine the unemployment rates, Buddha and Suda, that would be paid by each company. Okay, so um, we have to look up the, the wage base for each of these states first off. So in Iowa, we already know it's like 32,000 something. So all of that 22,000 would be taxable in Iowa. But in Kansas, um, does anybody have their book handy or they know off the top of their head what the tax, the rate is? Um, what, the, I'm sorry, the wage base is in Kansas? Um, 
you can I can probably look it up here too online, but So we're looking for 2022, though. You want the pseudo wage base? The pseudo wage base is what I'm looking for. Yeah, here we go. Here's 14. a. So it was 14,000 so. for 2022. Yeah. So there's Kansas, 14,000. Yep. Okay, so their wage base is different. Let's see. It's easier to just Google it than to look up, <laughs> than to pull up the textbook. Um, okay, so Roland is in Iowa. So all of the 22,000 would be taxable. 4.6%. But in Kansas, only 14,000 would be taxable. So it's just asking me to use this to determine the caps. Okay, so this is for both of them. So we got the SUDA, sorry. And in, uh, well, it's gonna be 7,000, it's gonna be $42. For FUDA. Sorry. The mat, I just know automatically that it's $42. Um, because 7000 for the wage base times 0 0.006 is always going to be $42. So if a company has the, the maximum, <clears throat> excuse me, the maximum credit, oh, then they, uh, like the maximum credit uh, reduction for the FUDA rate then it's the maximum they're going to pay for each employee is $42. It doesn't matter that it's two different companies. It does, it's two different states that each have their own, their own requirements, their own limits. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Sorry. So for the second, uh, uh, you Google, the Sura Bay, so. So, uh, on the, let's uh, say that again. In the second one, did you Google the, the what? 
the wage base, wage base. yeah in Kansas though um, so that's why I'm multiplying that by 14,000 because this wage base in Kansas so if he because he made 29,500 in Kansas but um, only 14,000 of that is going to be taxable. Where's the 7,000 came from? The 7,000 this is the wage base for FUDA so these are SUDA And they, the question asks you to then add them together. <clears throat> and that seven thousand is just from the wages, like it's the seven thousand from the twenty-two. Yeah. So only the for food purposes, only the first seven thousand is going to be taxed. So if you earned. $69.99. Then $69.99 is going to be taxable. Right. Other questions? Oh. How about out there? Where'd you guys go? I'm looking for you. No questions. Oh, and McKinney is here. Let me mark you present. Good. Okay. okay. Any more questions in here? Chapter four or chapter five? Um, one of the things that, so uh, Lisa and I were working on some chapter four problems and we ran across one problem that I think is wrong. Let me find it here. So I think it was um, for the number. Which the, do you remember which number it was, Lisa, the $82 versus $84? It was one that was the old, the pre-2020 method. Is it this one? I think it was this one. So this one's number 50. Um, no, it's not this one because this is using the percentage method. We want the, the wage bracket method. 49. Or was it 47? I think it was this one. I think it was this one when we were trying to figure out the federal income tax withheld on the W-2. Um, number 48. How? I don't recognize these names, though. So maybe it's... No? Sorry. 47. Yeah, it's 47. Sorry. <clears throat> 
and I believe it was um, Randy Meyer. I think the federal income. Am I getting this right? Is this the right one? Well, shoot. Now I can't remember. I can't remember which number it was. For some reason, I think it was this one. I could be wrong though. Okay. Shoot. Um, Wasn't it one of those that we had to go to? It was using it was using the the wage bracket right. method under the old. So the one that had the um, allowances, like two of them. Yeah. Allowances. Was it down here? But it wasn't. But we were using the table. We were not using the percentage method. That's not it. So, so it's not 47. I can't remember. No. It has to be that one. I was using the old one. Anyway, um, well, shoot. I'm not, I don't want to waste any more of your, of everybody's time. Um, looking for it. Um, but there is one one problem that's asking you to use the uh, pre-2020 method of withholding um, using the wage bracket method, not the percentage method. So that's the one where you're accessing the table. Um, where is it here? I've got it here somewhere. So it was using, if you recall, it was uh, weekly. I, I remember the, so it was single, weekly, and it was like, 800 or something but the the number i remember the withholding here was it was they were using the wrong line oh it it was the because it was 1255 dollars and five cents oh, right. um so 125 oh five anyway there's there's one of these problems that they used um it the income amount that's taxable is $1,255.05, which means that it's going to be, you're going to use, let's see, 12, where's 1255? I can't remember if it was this one or not, but um, it, 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 was, it was referencing the wrong line. They used the information from as though it was under $1,255. So I just wanted to make you guys aware of that if you haven't done that particular problem. Um, and of course your numbers may be different because each of the problems is a little bit different. So um, it might not even apply in your particular problem, but it was an issue that we came across in working on, um, working on chapter four problems. Sorry, I know that wasn't very clear because I can't tell you which, which problem it was. I apologize for that. All right. But the second column definitely says under. Yes. And it was above that. Yes. Yes. So we had an, had an issue with uh, with all of that. Okay. Let's move on. If nobody has any other questions, <clears throat> we're going to start looking at chapter six. All right. So final chapter. Here, we're going to start uh, talking about how we integrate all of this information <coughs> that we have uh, generated. 
with regard to payroll expense and, and taxes and all that, how we integrate it into the accounting system, the financial records. Because obviously, um, you know, for most companies that have employees, payroll is the largest single expense on their income statement, right? So anytime, um, so all of the information that's generated through the payroll department needs to be integrated accurately um, because otherwise it will have a big effect on the financial statements. And recall from your accounting classes, or if you're taking them now, that that financial information is being used by a lot of different people. It's being used by creditors to determine whether or not to lend money to the company. It's being used by investors for individuals trying to determine whether or not they want to invest in that in the company. Um, it's being used, that information also is oftentimes used for management for making decisions. Um, labor unions will use that information. So the information in the financial statements, um, it's critical that that information be accurate. And um, the payroll department itself wouldn't be making these entries into the accounting system. The accounting department would be doing that. Right, but the accounting department works very closely with the payroll department and would be obtaining that information from the payroll department. Um, so in this chapter, we're going to talk about how we do that. Um, so we're we're doing we're going back to journal entries. So we don't have uh, really we have we've discussed all of the taxes that we are going to discuss in this class. Of course, there could be other taxes related to payroll on a state-by-state -state basis for local governments, um, cities, counties, that sort of thing. But for our purposes to get the overview, we've discussed all of the taxes. Um, so we're come, kind of coming back to, remember right at the start, we talked about the payroll register, right, and the employee earnings record. So that the information that is entered onto those records is crucial for purposes of not only issuing those W-2 forms and uh, the, the 941 forms and the 940 forms that we have to file, but it's also crucial and used for entering the information into the accounting system. So we're gonna we're gonna kind of step back and, and take a look at those records once again. Um, we're going to talk about some of those deductions as well. And the chapter goes through and kind of defines many of these deductions. We've already talked about a lot of them. Some of them are voluntary deductions. So if you have the choice of paying for health insurance through your employer, um, that would be a voluntary type deductions. Certain uh, deductions are involuntary. So if you have a garnishment, um, some sort of levy against your wages, child support is a good example of that. If, if there's a court order that um, that the child support be paid directly through payroll withdrawal, well, that's an involuntary deduction. But all of those deductions, just like the taxes, all of those other types of deductions get collected from the payroll. And then the once that happens, the employer acts as sort of a trustee of that, of those funds. They have to then remit those funds to whatever um, whatever agency is, is required to get them. So just like with the taxes where we're withholding federal income taxes, say, and the employer keeps them for a little a little while, depending upon how much they have. Remember, they may have to pay it the next day. They may have to pay it uh, on, a, you know, in a few days or by the middle of the next month, depending upon uh, how much they have to remit in total. Um, but at some point, the employer has to remit those amounts. Right, so the same thing with the voluntary deductions. Employer collects it, and then the employer pays it out to whoever is due those funds. So we're gonna talk about those um, different types of funds and look at what the journal entries are for recording that as well. Um, 
and that's kind of topic two is we're going to look at what that journal the journal entries are we have several journal entries that we make within the payroll um, cycle so we make a journal entry anytime we pay an employee okay uh, so that kind of triggers uh, any payment to an employee is going to trigger a journal entry. Any payment to a um, to uh, the IRS, um, to the state for those income taxes, or to one of these um, agencies that receives the deduction amounts so of the health insurance company or child support enforcement. Anytime one of those agencies or organizations is paid, that triggers another journal entry. And then we have a third set of journal entries where we don't have a transaction that triggers it, but we have the end of the payroll, uh, the end of the accounting period that triggers it. That might be the end of the month might be the end of the year, the end of the quarter. Um, it, it's not a transaction then that triggers it and tells us we have to make a journal entry. It's the end of an accounting period that triggers it. Okay, so there's kind of three different times that we make journal entries. And we're going to talk about, um, we're going to look at those and, and discuss uh, how those journal entries are made. Um, general ledger accounts. Um, remember, we've once we've made those, journal entries that information gets posted to the general uh, to the general ledger and uh, well it goes to the general journal first which is a list of all of the, the journal entries that are made and then gets uh, transferred over to the general ledger and the general ledger is where we accumulate all of that information so every single expense item say for example payroll expense when we make a journal entry that we are where we're debiting payroll expense, the information from that journal entry ultimately ends up in the general ledger and it gets combined with other journal entries that have been made. And then that general ledger is used to create the financial statement, it goes to a trial balance, and then we create the financial statements with it. Um, these are the other two series of journal entries that I already talked about. So when we record payroll tax deposits, we make payments for taxes or it's like, like I said, when we also make payments for those other voluntary and involuntary deductions, a journal entry is made and then we've got the end of period adjustments that also have to be made. I gave you a little preview of those end of period adjustments and explaining why we have to do those because just remember the, the payroll cycle doesn't always match the accounting cycle. Right, especially if we are on a payroll cycle that is semi-monthly. Um, well, not, actually not semi-monthly for, for the most part, like weekly or bi-weekly um, because uh, they don't match, we have to create these end of period adjustments in order to accrue any payments that need to be made but haven't been made yet by the end of the accounting. Uh, cycle. So we're going to talk about this. Yeah. Is the payroll cycle typically like, is it like strictly like January to December sort of thing usually? So the, um, as far as reporting like W-2s and things of that nature, yes, it's always going to be January 1st through December 31st, right? You may have uh, employers, there are certain industries where they don't have their their financial accounting year isn't January to December. Maybe it's July 1st to June 30th. A lot of nonprofits do it that way. The governmental entities do it. They start their fiscal year October 1st and then ends September 30th. There are certain the retail industry uh, likes to have a fiscal year of starting February 1st through January 31st because to to account for that busy end of the year holiday season and all the buying and then returns that oftentimes happen in January as well. So they may be different, yeah. Um, schools typically, don't they do it like a month or two months after the, what was that, the spring semester ends? 
So um, then they can like get all, because if they do it in December, yeah. then they're right in the middle of school and it, right. like, it doesn't right. match up. But if and, they do it like right yeah. after that, then they have time. Oftentimes they'll also match up with federal um, or state uh, fiscal year because they're getting their funding, a lot of their funding from those um, those entities or those those jurisdictions. So they want to match it, match it up with, with them. But um, so we don't always, you know, we can't always match up the payroll cycle with the fiscal, um, the fiscal year. Um, we also have this experience of if you are, let me pull up a calendar so it makes it a little bit easier to to look at. So let's just say, oops. Right. Do I get this off? There we go. So if we look at a calendar here, I know that's kind of small, I'm sorry. Um, so April might be a good example. If we have a, say we have a biweekly payroll cycle um, and we've got, we have financial statements that we prepare every month. Right, so we're going to have financial statements that have to actually have to record financial transactions through April 30th. But maybe we've got a payroll period. If we're on a biweekly cycle, maybe we had a payroll period that started on the 22nd, but ends on the 5th. So all of these wages between the 22nd and the 30th, they're accrued. We we have to pay those out but we don't have to pay them out until the fifth right so we now have to figure out well how much how much do we owe through there and we've got to accrue that liability because now we've got we've got payroll liability because we're going to have to pay those uh pay our employees we've got a uh, tax liability because we've accrued payroll tax um at taxes during up through the 30th as well. So we're gonna to have to create an, a journal entry, I'm sorry, a journal entry for um, for the end of the, I can, I can make it disappear, but I can't make it come back. Um, we're gonna to have to create a journal entry for April 30th that accounts for those liabilities that we are then going to have to pay um, at some point in the future. So um, I wanna look at that, uh, how we do those journal entries. All right, so not, you can't see what I see. There we go. Okay, so um, this is pretty much what, what we just went through here. So these are, um, we have to end, this is the order of entering data, payroll data. So we start out entering information into the payroll register and then and into the employee earnings records and remember, Payroll register is information from the entire payroll, all employees. Um, employee earnings record that is on a per employee basis, um, and it's cumulative. The payroll register isn't cumulative, it's just for one particular payroll. Employee earnings record is cumulative, so we keep that going all year long. Use that to prepare, help prepare the W-2s um, at the end of the year. And then that information gets transferred over to the, the general journal. So this is where we make those journal entries for, and th these are it's just kind of a reiteration of the journal entries that I already talked about there. Um, there are three different times that we make journal entries, but there are actually four sets of journal entries. These first two, um, happen at the same time. Journalizing the gross payroll and amounts that are withheld from the employees. So this is all of the, everything having to do with the employee's portion of taxes and withholdings. The next journal entry that is made at the same time are the amounts that the employer has to pay. Remember the employer has their own uh, payroll taxes that they have to then remit. So, um, and we also talk, uh, they also in this chapter discusses workers' compensation insurance and the journal entry that's made um, pertaining to that. 
Um, and then at different times, we have this journal entry, which records the payment of payroll taxes. And then we have our final journal entry that records those end of period adjustments. Then at the end of the period, the end of the accounting period, if it's April 30th, then we're going to post all of those entries to the general ledger so that the financial statements can be um, can be generated. All right, so I, we really don't have to go through in detail these. You should you should have this down, the payroll register, the information that's on the payroll register. So remember, that's the one that shows for each each time employees are paid. We're going to have a payroll register, right? It's not on a per employee basis. It is for the entire payroll. Um, and you'll recall how uh, how those are set up. We're going to have a list of all of the employees, all of their gross payroll. Maybe if they had overtime, we're going to record the overtime that was paid. So it's going to it's it's going to um, comprise all of that information. Um, though that payroll register, and I think we talked about this early on as well, should um, what we call foot, uh, which means we're, we're going to want to make sure that. And if you're using Excel, it really shouldn't be too much of a problem or software. This really uh, pertains to those who are doing it by hand, um, but making sure that all of the rows match, that all of the, the I'm sorry, all of the rows added up together match all of the columns as well. So you're just you're just making sure that your math is correct. Right. You do. So that's what they're talking about here, um, footing and proving a couple of different ways. Um, that's what that's referencing. Now, the employee earnings record, remember, that is on a per employee basis. It is cumulative. Um, it's used to we use that information to prepare that payroll register. Um, also to prepare reports required for state unemployment compensation. Remember, the state what we just went through state unemployment we have to we have to keep track of whether or not employees have met that wage base so we're going to use the employee earnings record to record um, or to to access the data for each individual employee because once they've met that wage base like for FUDA once they've exceeded seven thousand dollars of taxable wages FUDA taxable wages we don't it's not taxable anymore Right. So that's why we need to have that information for each individual employee. Um, let's see. And that's what they're talking about here as well as OASDI. Remember, we've got that once they've reached that hundred and forty seven thousand dollar wage base, they're no longer subject to Social Security tax. So um, we'll, we will use that in order to determine when employees have made uh, met that uh, that wage base um, governmental agencies oftentimes payroll departments will get surveys from different state and federal agencies department of labor um, different different departments they want to know you, you know every month they come out with information on how many jobs have been created during the during the month, they get information about what sectors have added jobs, what sectors have reduced um, employment. All of that information comes from employers who fill out these surveys. So um, Bureau of Labor Strat Statistics, they, these get sent out to payroll departments and they have to be filled out. The pay the employee earnings record and the payroll register provide um, data in order to fill out those um, those forms. Employee grievances. So if there's some sort of dispute, you know, I should have been paid X amount. I worked three hours of overtime. No, you worked two hours of overtime. You know that that employee earnings record can be used um, as well. And in addition to uh, filling out W two forms, right? Since it is on an employee by employee basis. All right, so that's just kind of a, a summary of how that information um, 
in those reports is used not only by the payroll department but by other um, other departments and even outside agencies as well. All right, so let's let's do a little review. Debits and credits. Everybody remember their debits and credits? <laughs> Has it been a while? <laughs> Some of you are taking it right now. Yeah. So we've got. It's not the same as your bank account. Remember what you know. Your when you get a bank statement or you download it from online, you've got a column of debits and you've got a column of credits. Well, for banks, a credit means you've added something. Don't. I, I, this is just an example. I don't want you to get confused between the between accounting debits and credits and banking debits and credits because they're actually kind of opposite. Um, on your bank statement, if you see a credit, it means money has been deposited into your account. If you see a debit, it means money has been taken out of your account. That's why they call it a debit card, because it's you're withdrawing money from that from your account. Well, in accounting, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that something's gone in and something's come out. What it means is left and right. So a debit is an it's abbreviated DR. I don't know why the R is there. <laughs> I don't. I, I can understand for credits. That makes sense. But debit has a DR on it. I'm not quite sure. Um, debit simply means left. And credit means right. That's it. Pretty easy. Now, why do we talk about left and right? Because journal entries will always consist of information that is entered on the left side of the column. You, you've always got two columns in any journal entry. Information, numbers that are entered on the left side of the column, and then enter numbers that are entered on the right side of the column, right? So um, it, because it says credit doesn't mean anything's been added to the it, it has nothing necessarily to do with cash coming in or something going out. Each account has a normal balance, meaning that when you increase the amount in that account, it's always going to go on the left or it's always going to go on the right. Opposite is true. Each account has when that the account is decreased is going to be the opposite then. So, for example, we have some of the accounts that normally have debit balances are asset accounts. These are things like, and they could be long-term or short-term assets. So things like cash, cash is an asset. It's something that you can use in the future to generate revenue. Um, equipment is an asset. It helps to generate, it help, will help to generate revenue at some point in the, in the future. Um, uh, buildings, land, all of those things are assets, right? So assets always have their normal balance is a debit balance. If you have a credit balance in an asset account, you've got a problem. If you've got a credit balance in your cash account, it means that you are overdrawn. You don't have, you have minus money in there, minus uh, cash in there. So assets, expenses. Expenses also have a normal debit balance. That means when you, uh, we create a journal entry that has an expense to it. So for example, wages expense. If we're paying somebody, that's an expense, right? We're, we're generating an expense there. That expense, which increases, again, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's, it's, you're putting expenses in or anything like that. It just means that the account itself is, the number in that account is increasing. So wages expense, when you make an entry for wages expense, you're going to debit wages expense because it's increasing the wages expense, okay? That expense account. So assets, expenses, the other account, which we really don't talk about in this class, but just for your information, is dividends. 
dividends, whenever we pay, whenever a company pays dividends, they're going to debit that. Okay. Again, it doesn't mean that because if you think about it, they're paying dividends, cash is actually going out of the company. Well, the dividends account is going up, but there's going to be another account that goes down, which is cash. So these are the these are the accounts that normally have a debit balance. You'll notice, I don't know if anybody's ever, if you've ever encountered this little mnemonic device, AED. For those who are from Iowa, Anderson, Erickson, Dairy, right? AED. If you can remember that, I will tell you that this, this has helped me think through many journal entries. Okay. What kind of account is it? Okay. If it's it's an expense account, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna debit it. All right. So AED, Anderson, Erickson, Dairy. Okay. Every other account has a credit balance. A normal credit balance. So liabilities, equity accounts, every other type of account is going to have a credit balance. So all you really have to remember is AE Dairy. AE Dairy, debit. Everything else is going to have a credit balance, a normal credit balance. Okay. So that said, again, debit left, credit right. Um, anytime, so if expenses, you said expenses are a debit balance, anytime we pay somebody, we're going to have a wage expense, we're going to debit that. Now, remember as well, these two have to balance. They have to balance. If you have a journal entry that doesn't balance, you have an incorrect journal entry. I can't tell you. It's just kind of a little anecdote. I used to teach intermediate accounting, which intermediate accounting means you've taken print one, you've taken print two, you've taken a bunch of other classes first before you get to intermediate accounting. I had students who their journal entries didn't balance. I was a little shocked. Something's wrong with that. <laughs> so these two have to balance. They always have to be the same number. So that and that is for each journal entry. And it's for the sum total of all journal entries. Okay, so if each and that makes sense, if each journal entry balances, then then the sum total is also going to balance. If they don't balance, something is wrong. Right? That's one of the things that, that accountants like, though, right? That's one of the things that attracts us to accounting is it balances. It's nice. It, it's not, it, it, it's definitive, right? It's not like sociology or English where there's all these different interpretations and opinions. In accounting, it either is or it isn't, right? So, um, these two sides have to balance, okay? When, and like I said, for individual journal entries, as well as overall for all of the journal entries in an accounting period, right? It's it, it, within those confines of an accounting period, whether that's a month or a quarter or a year, um, both sides have to balance, okay? Um, now, one of the things that, uh, is advisable for um, for payroll departments, for accounting departments, is to not just have, especially for larger organizations, not just have wage expense or salary expense. You want to know how much the expenses are in each department, right? That gives you the more specific you can be, the more information you can extract from uh, from the accounting records. So instead of just having wage expense, you might have wage expense. Well, they've got research here. Purchasing, accounting, uh, executives, you know, whatever the department, technology department. Because when you are specific like that, then you can extract that information and it's much more usable information. If a company is looking to 
uh, add, say the purchasing department needs to add a, uh, a couple of employees, but they have a budget for their expenses, for their wage expense. Well, if we've got, if we know how much they've spent on wages, we can know whether or not able to add those employees. You know, if they're already over budget on wages, then they've got a problem. They're probably not efficiently using their, the employees that they have. So it, it gives a lot more specific information, uh, specific um, data in order to extract uh, financial information. Okay, so wages, this is the big expense that we use in, in payroll, wages expense. And we're gonna have others called payroll tax expense. Remember the employer also has to pay payroll taxes. So that's an expense for them, payroll tax expense. Um, withholding is credited to a liability account. So liabilities we have credit balances over on the right here. So why is it, why is it a liability account? Well, remember when it's being withheld from employees pay, the company doesn't get to keep it. They're going to have to send it off somewhere else, right? That's, and actually, that's a, that's a mistake that the, a lot of companies do make. They'll withhold it, and then they forget the second part of it, actually paying it to the IRS, and then they get in a lot of trouble for doing that. But it's an amount that they have to pay at some point in the future, right? Which is essentially what a liability is. You've got you got to pay something in the future. So the withholding taxes that are withheld from employees pays are credited uh, to a liability account. So it might, and usually the liability accounts are called payables. Makes sense, right? You're gonna have to pay it. It's, it's payable uh, as opposed to receivables, and oftentimes students will get those two confused, pretty easy to get those confused. Receivables means somebody else owes you money, right? They, 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 you're on the receiving end. Um, but for our purposes, these are usually called pay, uh, payables. So we pay, we pay an employee, we're gonna withhold federal income taxes from their paycheck. Now we have federal income taxes payable. Social Security taxes, payable. Medicare taxes, payable. If we've withheld uh, health insurance premiums, then maybe we've got a, a health insurance premiums payable, or Wells, Wellmark payable, that sort of thing. Anything that's come out of the employee's gross paycheck is going to be a payable, okay? Um, all other payroll deductions are also like, oh, that's what I was just talking about with like, not just taxes, but, um, cause they just talk about tax here, but any other type of garnishment, anything that's anything that's been withheld from an employee paycheck that needs to then go to somebody else is going to be called a payable. It's a liability. And again, it's going to have a credit balance. Um, so these are uh, these are examples of some of the other types of deductions. I already kind of give you an introduction to you know, some of them are voluntary, some of them are involuntary. So group insurance premiums, usually that's usually that's voluntary. Sometimes it's not voluntary. Sometimes you're like every employee automatically is en enrolled in their life insurance, uh, the group life insurance and you don't really have a choice in it. Um, health insurance premiums, health savings account deductions, uh, purchase of government savings bonds. I don't see that very often, but there are you, there are some employers that offer you the opportunity. It's a, just another way to save money, but instead of it going into a bank account, it's going to purchase uh, savings bonds. Um, union dues. That's that those that money is going to be withheld and sent off to the union. Any garnishments, these are involuntary. Uh, so if you've got tax levies or other debt levies um, or child support, those would be garnishments. Pension and retirement contributions as well. 
These are amounts that the employee is paying. Okay? These would all then be categorized as payables, liabilities, that are then going to be sent off. Those funds are going to be sent off then to um, other, some other organization or company. All right, so now we're, we're just going to kind of go through real quickly here these different types of garnishments because we talked about a lot of these already in other chapters. Um, so group insurance, this is that life insurance. We, you already had in chapter four when you were doing some of the, the W-2 problems, you had an example of group term life insurance. There were certain amounts of premiums that were then taxable had to be added to the the, ta the taxable wages of the employee. So that's what we're talking about here, group insurance, um, life insurance for the most part. Um, it could be other types of insurance as well, like AFLAC and stuff like that. Um, but any amounts that, that are withheld from the employee's paycheck then are going to be categorized as, um, as liabilities, okay? Health insurance, same thing. So if the employee pays any amount toward their health insurance, then that is, uh, with when we when we do our journal entry, that is going to be a um, a liability. Um, they do health insurance is kind of funny because sometimes, um, well, oftentimes, it is actually paid up front. So the employer pays. So for example, we're in April. Um, DMAC probably paid the April premium either at the end of March or at the beginning of April. And now during April is withholding the premiums, the employee's portion of the premium from the paychecks. So you've already, you're already receiving the benefit of it. You're not paying behind for that. You're paying ahead for it so it, but it would be treated the same way that's just kind of an fyi uh, that's why they talk about employers portion of the premium often paid in advanced and debited to prepaid health insurance any prepaid account is an asset okay so it would be have a debit balance government savings bonds same thing um, uh, if an employee chooses to save through the purchase of savings bonds and they have them paid through their their paycheck that would then be uh, uh would end up being a liability until the employer then actually sends the money off to the uh the irs or not the irs the treasury department union dues same thing when employees either voluntarily or even involuntarily um, are part of a union dues will be uh, will be withheld from their paychecks and then those dues get sent off to the uh, to the union. Uh, garnishments, these are things uh, that are you don't have a choice about it. Right? Um, some of those other ones you might have a choice about you might not, but you might have a choice garnishments you don't have a choice. Um, you owe the em the employee owes some amount and they have been ordered by the court to pay it. Right? So they really don't, the only way for them to get out of paying it is to go to court and argue that they shouldn't have to pay it. Um, examples of that, federal tax levy. So if they owe money to the IRS and they haven't paid it, the federal government can garnish your wages, can, can keep your wages from you in order to pay that amount that's due. Child support. As well, that is another one that is uh, is mandatory. Now, some people will pay their if they're if they're good about just paying it every month on their own. Usually, that's fine. But there are a lot of individuals that have it garnished because they're not maybe not so good at paying it, um, or it's just easier for them uh, to do it that way. So, um, bankruptcy. If you've declared bankruptcy, but you still have amounts that have to be paid because. In bankruptcy, depending upon how it's filed, there are these different chapters. Um, you may have to repay, may still be on the hook for certain amounts. So if there's a bankruptcy order, uh, any other type of creditor. So 
credit cards, um, banks that have lent you money and you haven't paid it back. They can come and garnish your, the wages. Student loans can be garnished as well. Um, federal administrative wage garnish. Any that's kind of like a catch-all. This is showing the priority. So it's entirely possible that you've got more than one, <laughs> that an employee has more than one garnishment, right? So maybe they owe money on to the federal, to the IRS for taxes, and they've got child support, and they've got student loan company that's coming after them. So these have to have an order to them because they cannot garnish all of your paycheck. They can only garnish up to a certain amount of a paycheck. You've got to be able to still have some to live on, right? So as a result of that, they, there is an order to these. First priority is federal taxes and child support. That comes out first. Then if there's anything left over, these other ones will, will kick in, okay? Payroll departments get notifications of these. And they're not, they don't have to calculate how much is owed. They may have to calculate as far as the, the limits of how much can be garnished. But usually those garnishment orders come with some very specific instructions on how to garnish them. When a payroll department gets a garnishment order, they have to abide by it. You cannot, uh, and, and it happens where the payroll department gets a garnishment order, they start garnishing, the employee comes in and says, don't take anything out. No, this is, we're, we're in the middle of negotiating this. Payroll department can't do anything until they get another court order saying stop the garnishment or change it in some way. The employee doesn't have the power to tell payroll stop, okay? Um, and I mean, though, it, it happens, it happens. Um, and unfortunately, what we'll off, uh, what happens quite frequently as well is people will hop around to different jobs to avoid these garnishments. So because it usually takes a little while for these uh, creditors to realize that the employee has switched jobs. So they might be able to get a few payroll cycles out of it, right? Maybe it takes a couple of months before child support catches up and then the employee quits before and then goes to another job before they can actually enforce it. That happens, unfortunately, that happens. Okay, so this cons uh, Consumer Credit Protection Act is the act that limits the amount of wages that are subject to garnishment. Um, it depends on what type of garnishment it is, what the limit is. So student loan, you can, you can't, they can't take as much out for student loans as they can for child support. It's based on a percentage. They, the employee has to be able to, like I said, they've got to still be able to go to the grocery store and pay their rent and all that. So it is limited. Um, maximum amount of disposable earnings that can be garnished for debt repayment. So here we're talking about a debt that's that's owed, not necessarily child support. 25% um, of disposable earnings or the amount by which the disposable earnings exceed 30 times the federal minimum wage rate. So those two different calculations that would then um, be done to determine what's the greatest amount. So if you've got, a, a, let's say a student loan debt and you're supposed to take out, or maybe the, the debt repayment is $300 a week, but the employee only makes $500 a week, they're not gonna get $300 a week that is going to be limited, right? They can't get the whole amount. They're gonna get a, a smaller amount. Um, or beneficiaries. Okay, so if uh, any notices from Social Security don't need a court order. If it's a notice from Social Security, that can come right out. Um, child support. So, um, Immediate withholding for child support payments. As soon as the payroll department receives that notice, on the next payday, they have to garnish. Okay, so on the next the next uh, payday, they can't just wait a couple of weeks or something, or like the next you know couple of pay paydays. Um, 
the employer can also charge some administrative fees for having to garnish because it takes time out right of the the payroll departments um, of, of their regular duties that fee gets assessed to the employee not to the agency so it would be you know, say that okay we're going to charge yeah we'll garnish it but it's you're going to pay us two dollars every for every paycheck right the, the employee they can mandate that um so electronic payments for, for the most part that's kind of how it would happen to so notes are withhold, withheld and then sent off to the um state child support this one again takes precedence over most voluntary and involuntary deductions it's first in line maximum amount that can be withheld from disposable earnings is between 50 to 65 percent of their disposable income depending upon other obligations and the number of the weeks that the employees in arrears like i said they those specific instructions get sent to the payroll department on how to calculate um, how much can be withheld but you can see the you know before it was 25 percent now it's 50 to 65 percent can be withheld so they're not messing around with regard to child support. Uh, federal taxes. This is if you owe money to the IRS. Um, so second priority, uh, take second priority after child support. So it's next in line after child support. Um, let's see what else do I want to say about this. Not really not much else that needs to be said about it. takes effect within three days of the receipt of the levy notice with the first wage payment. Again, you can't can't wait for that. So pension and retirement contributions, sometimes these are voluntary. Some if you're a state employee, they are not voluntary, they are involuntary. You have to uh, participate. But a lot of private employees, employers will give a choice to their employees. Um, sometimes employers finance finance them, pay for it entirely. Sometimes employees pay for it, contribute entirely. Oftentimes it's a combination of the two, right? The employer will pay a little bit and then the employee also pays um, a little bit. So um, those amounts then are withheld. And as, if, as you recall, they are pre-tax for, so for, I'm sorry, for, income tax purposes, but not pre-tax for Social Security and Medicare tax purposes. Um, different types of pensions, 401ks, 403bs, 457bs, I think it's 457. Um, the different numbers pertain to the section of the tax code where the where they are defined. They just, and like 401k is for private employers. 403b is for governmental I think employees, uh, people who are employed by the government, 457s, nonprofit organization. So they just have a different number, same type of concept though. Uh, those deductions, again, when it's deducted, then it's going to be recorded as a liability. When the when it's paid, then what happens is this reverses. So when the payment is made, then that liability is going to be debited because it's decreasing the amount that's owed there's a decrease in that account what the the other side of it is going to be cash which is credited cash remember is an asset it's decreasing so it's going to be credited so that's the second um second journal entry that well second series of journal entries that gets made but we'll and we'll go through specifically what those journal entries look like Um, so different ways that employees can get paid. You can get paid in cash. It's really inconvenient to do that. Um, but it, it can happen. There's nothing that says you can't pay in cash. Um, usually employees are going to be paid by check or direct deposit is probably the most common way. Um, but there are some other ways as well. Um, that employees can be paid. One of the one common one is pay cards. Essentially, your payment comes on a debit card. 
Um, that is a great way to get paid for individuals who don't have bank accounts. There are a lot of people who don't have bank accounts. Uh, a lot of people in this country do not have bank accounts. Um, so they get paid on a debit card. The funds just get deposited onto that debit card. Now, it can also be really inconvenient because you don't really, you know, you don't have a checking account. So if you need to pay rent or something like that, and usually write a check, it would, you know, it's difficult to do that. Uh, your, your cash, anytime you want cash, you're going to be limited probably on a daily basis how much cash you can withdraw. Also, those pay cards oftentimes have fees attached to them. So um, it, it, there are a lot of fast food restaurants have been using these pay cards to pay their employees. Now they have to, they cannot mandate that you, that this is the only way that you're going to get paid. If the employee wants a check or some other form of payment, direct deposit, the employer has to do that. They cannot force employees to be paid on a pay card. Right. But that's another way that um, employees can get paid. Um, as they say here, so they, employers have to offer at least one other option in addition to that prepaid card. Um, let's see, pay stubs always should accompany the payment. Oftentimes they're sent electronically these days or even through email, that sort of thing. Uh, Final pay, just real quick here, we'll finish this up. Um, final pay, what happens when an employee quits or is fired? When do they have to get their final pay? Depends on what state they're in. In Iowa, they just get paid on the next regular pay period. So if they quit on Monday and pay doesn't happen till next month, they get their final pay is next month. Um, some states will require a quicker payment. So as I say here, California, Minnesota require, they've got to be paid on that day. So there's nothing, yeah, so the payroll department has to get their acting gear and get a paycheck issued to that employee. Some, uh, it's maybe the next, like within three days that they have to get paid. There's no federal law that says they have, that final pay has to be issued within a particular period of time, but state laws will. Like I said, in Iowa, it's just the next regular payday. You don't have to give an employee um, their pay any sooner than that. All right, so we are out of time. We will pick up on unclaimed wages. Well, this is kind of interesting, actually. I always have students go to, uh, there's a website in Iowa where you can look up to see if anybody owes you any money. Um, and it, it, you never, you didn't receive it. Um, it's related to these unclaimed wages. All right, questions? All right, so if you have any homework questions, I will stick around for a little bit. If you don't, feel free to go. It is up to you.